Thanks, Tim. Thanks for having me uh, on the on the program today. Uh, yes, our disclaimer. I'd like to talk to you, as Tim said, about Cinebits, our lithium project in the Czech Republic. Just quickly on the macro, lithium has obviously had a good run in the markets uh, over the last six to nine months. A little a bit of a resurgence based on a few mac macro factors, um, following on from the fact that I think the sector was largely oversold in uh, 2019 and into 20, early part of 2020. But the macro factors uh, globally have been just a dramatic increase in the number of electric vehicles that we're seeing and that are projected into the, um, the next few years. And for us, it's really- Keith, Keith, excuse me. Can I just ask you to speak up a little bit? It's a bit hard to hear. How's that? Any better? Hello? Yeah, maybe a little bit louder if you don't mind. Okay. Um, That's better. All about where we, are, where we are in the European Union. So the, the growth in demand for lithium in the EU is going to grow faster than anywhere else in the world, at least out until 2030, based upon the projections for the number of EVs to be built in the area, in the region, and the, the enormous uh, support being thrown behind the development of a new battery industry in that part of the world. And this is a region that has no current production of battery-grade lithium pro products. So that's really the premise for where we are and where we're, where we're going forward. <clears throat> a little about the project itself. So as you see from this slide, Cinevitz is the largest hard rock lithium resource in Europe. Importantly, it's by far the largest in the EU. That's an important distinction given the support from the EU for this project, this industry. It's the fourth largest non-brine lithium resource in the world. So it's a very large resource. We've done two PFSs on the project. We'll be a bottom half cost uh, producer, bottom half of the global cost curve for either battery grade lithium hydroxide or battery grade uh, lithium carbonate. I have a map in a moment to show you exactly where it's located, but within 500 miles of the project, there are about 6 million vehicles made every year. And obviously every year, more and more of those vehicles are being made electric. At various stages during 2020, Europe, uh, overtook China in terms of production of electric vehicles, and we expect that trend to continue. And the final point on this slide is we've entered into some significant strategic partnerships in 2020, the most notable being taking uh, CHES, the Czech Power Utility, uh, on as our partner level project in um, February, March of last year. They injected uh, almost 50 million Australian dollars into the project at that point. And so the project itself is fully funded now through to our final investment decision, expected in a little over a year's time. Next slide, please, Tim. The, the two partnerships I referred to, the CEZ Group, CHES, as I mentioned there at the top, and at the bottom, EIT Inno Energy. So EIT Inno Energy is an arm of the European Union. It's the principal facilitator of the European Battery Alliance. And their job, if you like, is to ensure that the policy and the money that the EU has put aside for the development of a, a battery industry and the development of the region's critical raw materials is put to good effect. So from our point of view, they're actively involved in assisting us in funding the project, in introducing us to potential off-takers, in assisting us with uh, messaging, permitting, um, and just in general ways, getting the project forward and into development. Next slide, please, Tim. And a little more on CHES that I mentioned earlier, I won't read all of these slides in the interest of time, but CHES are heavily involved in, in green energy. Uh, they're involved in wind farms. They own all of the EV charging stations throughout the Czech Republic. Uh, they're a public company with a market cap of around uh, 11 billion euros. So a very good partner for us, Tim. Uh, this is the map I mentioned earlier. You can see us there, the red dot in the middle of the uh, of the screen and all the, the household names that surround us, very big auto makers, all of which are going EV, uh, very big battery manufacturers, cathode makers, et cetera, et cetera. Every time we do this slide, someone else appears on it. It's a fast growing space. Next slide, please. The project summary. So Cinevitz is a historic tin mine. Tin has been mined here off and on for nearly 600 years. Um, we will be re-entering an existing underground mine. So from that point of view, low impact, 
from an ESG perspective, which is becoming more and more important. We'll have a large bulk underground mining operation. Uh, the, the front end of our, pro, of our process will be conducted under mine, again, underground, again, to lessen the, the impact, the social and environmental impact. And then a slurry pipe of our lithium concentrate to a nearby processing part, uh, plant. Tim, next slide. The infrastructure itself, as I mentioned, it's a historic mining area. Everything that we need is in place, power and water, uh, road and rail, and there's a mining workforce, uh, which is very important. It's a, it's a historic coal mining area, so we will be retraining uh, coal miners to become lithium miners. This is very much in keeping with the EU's transition from coal-fired energy to green energy. And uh, that, that's something that the EU is strongly supporting in a number of ways, including in grants. Next slide, please. A uh, quick snapshot of the, the process here. It's a, a very simple, straightforward extraction process, very similar to any spodumene concentrate extraction process you might see. Uh, our host rock is not spodumene, it's a mica called zimbaldite. Most people who follow the, the lithium space are very familiar with spodumene and the processing route here. And this slide simply demonstrates the similarities between our processing route and that of spodumene. We do have a couple of advantages which assist us with costs and also assist in helping lower our CO2 footprint, both of which are very important considerations. I think all mining projects are going to come under pressure to demonstrate their environmental credentials in the coming years. And uh, our process assists with that, as does the fact that we are located very close to our end users. The whole world has had a shift back towards the importance of local supply chains with COVID and other factors during 2020. This not only assists in, in the form of mineral security and also in costs, but it also helps very much obviously with your CO2 footprint if you're not shipping vast quantities of materials from one side of the world to the other. The next slide shows our most recent preliminary feasibility study, which we conducted in June of 2019. Showed, uh, it showed an NPV of this project after tax of 1.1 billion US dollars and an IRR of nearly 29%, also after tax. Importantly, the fact that we can produce battery grade lithium hydroxide <clears throat> net of our tin credits for just under three and a half thousand dollars a tonne as I mentioned earlier, puts us very much in the bottom half of the global cost curve and uh, very much underlines the, uh, the financial credentials of the project. Uh, this this um, study is currently being updated to a definitive feasibility study, the results of which we'll have in about 12 months. At that stage, the project will become bankable and uh, that's when we'll, we'll start raising the money or conclude raising the money to go to construction construction phase in about the middle of that year. Uh, next one, please, Tim. So what we need to do in the next 12 months, as I say, we're well into this definitive feasibility study and the associated studies regarding that. We are about uh, two thirds of the way through a drilling program right now. That drilling program is designed to help us bring a larger part of our resource into the measured category which is all about funding the project, all about giving um, more comfort to the, the debt providers. There are a number of um, key studies within that DFS that we'll be ticking off as we go through the early stages of this year and obviously announcing those results to the market. But probably the key for us in the next few months is to secure offtake. Very important for a lithium project to get offtake ahead of um, financing the project. And I think we've all seen the very positive effect on some other lithium stocks listed on ASX um, over the last six or so months when they've um, signed off take agreements with big well-known um, battery makers or electric vehicle makers. Next slide, please. Uh, as I said to you, the lithium space has had a good run over the last six to nine months. And you can see that reflected in our own share price. Um, our market cap currently has stayed under 200 million Australian dollars. Uh, the, the best way to look at that in terms of value and, and where we're sitting on our own value curve, we own half of a project with an NPV of 1.1 billion US. So that's 550 million US or about 700, just over 700 million Aussie dollars versus our market cap of 200. 
Uh, all companies tend to trade a little at, at a, some sort of discount to their MPV. We're 12 months out from final investment decision on a project that's fully funded with significant partners and no uh, foreseeable barriers to getting into production. So I think you've got to look at that market cap in light of that value. And I think we are trading a significant discount to the sector and a number of our peers. Next one, please, Tim. So here's the summary, almost right on time, I think. Uh, largest lithium resource in Europe, by far the largest in the EU, in an area in which the demand for lithium is going to grow very strongly out until at least 2030. Project that's fully funded to final investment decision with significant partners and the active support of the European Union, who's supporting this industry in a very, very strong way, both financially, but also politically with policy, policy and legislation. Uh, I think we're in a very good position and looking forward to 2021. And I'll wrap it up there. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Keith. Good timing. Um, a couple of questions. You recently raised around $7 million and there was a, uh, a global ESG fund as, a, uh, as part of that capital raising, took up shares. Um, what spurred the, the interest, particularly this year, um, from those sort of funds in lithium companies? So as, I, as I see, you know, the resurgence in the lithium uh, space last year came from a number of macro factors. But, you know, there, there was a very, very strong global push towards uh, green energy, uh, being well aware of your CO2 footprint and all ESG considerations. And this is particularly strong in Europe. It, it seems to be stronger in areas where, uh, you know, there's greater population density um, and, and a great awareness of the environment, looking after the environment. So there are a number of these funds that are, have been established over the last 12 to 18 months. The attraction to us is that they, these are the sort of funds who we don't think are coming into the lithium space or into our project just because it's a hot sector and they're looking for a quick flip. I think these are people who we expect to be long-term shareholders of the company, who we expect to be able to go back to uh, at some stage over the next 12 months when we are looking to raise our portion of the equity component of our capex, which will be a significant amount of money. And these are the sort of people who understand the space, understand the project, coming in for them in a relatively small way to begin with. So the, the fund you're talking about, Thematica Future Mobility, contributed uh, 5 million Aussie dollars to that 7 million raise. For them, that's a relatively small investment, but if you like, that's a, a start where they can get to know the project, get to know the sector better. Um, and hopefully that means they'll be there for us when we need the big money later in the year. And, and in Australia, we, we kind of see the, the local fund managers are invested in the spodumene players, which have a higher carbon footprint in terms of the extraction of, of lithium and, and export of lithium. Do you see a kind of switch coming where those fund managers... Um, ..investment? I, look, I think potentially we will see that. I mean, obviously, as a fund manager, you know, you, your first um, your first responsibility is a return, you know, making money for your stakeholders. But as as ESG considerations, CO two considerations become uh, more and more important globally, you know, a, a, a lot of funds will switch to this sort of um, you know this sort of investment because of the fact that it is seen to be more uh, environmentally friendly. You know, the, the, the spodumene concentrate story here in Australia, WA in particular, it, it's a reasonably simple business plan. You know, dig up the rocks, beneficiate them, send them to Asia. And it's obviously something we've been doing in iron ore for, for decades. It's an understood business plan. You know, ours is a little more complex. We'll be going right through to end product, going right through to lithium hydroxide and then selling that directly to, to end users who's is uh, 100 or 125 uh, miles from us, you know, in the, in the project site. But, uh, you know, it is becoming more and more important. Currently, there are funds who specifically target this sort of investment, but I think that sentiment will start to permeate through all uh, fund managers over time. And, and just one uh, last question, kind of why well, you can't disclose these exact details of offtake discussions. Can you, can you broadly talk to the, the level of interests? 
Yes, look, I think that the, the best way to look at this is to look back to Tesla and Battery Day. And, you know, the things that they said then at Battery Day from a macro point of view, and then also the fact that they entered into an offtake agreement with uh, Piedmont, a development company at a similar stage to where we're at. And really the first strong indication that the sector is understanding it needs to look outside the major producers of lithium, the historic sources, uh, it needs to look outside those people going forward because the demand is going to grow so quickly. And the awareness that you know, the, the industry has to support development companies in getting into production to ensure there is going to be enough supply going forward. You know, and I think that's a large part of what we're seeing. The Europe is a very conservative business place. You know, we've seen here very strong interest in, in our spodumene industry from, from Asia, from China in particular. Now we've seen American companies coming into it, and I think Europe will follow, but there's just that natural conservatism that means everything happens a little slower.